East Carolina has big shoes to fill after losing the tandem of American Offensive Player of the Year, Shane Carden, and the NCAA career receptions leader, Justin Hardy. That's not to mention star offensive coordinator Lincoln Riley, who left Greenville to join Bob Stoops' staff at Oklahoma. The Pirates had a dominant first half of the 2014 season, winning six of their first seven games. The only loss coming to South Carolina, but picked up noteworthy back-to-back -back wins against ACC opponents Virginia Tech and North Carolina. They were number 23 in the first ever college football playoff ranking and remained in the top 25 for four consecutive weeks heading on the road to Temple in the beginning of November, when they were stunned in tough weather conditions by the Owls. Then the purple and gold would suffer late season heartbreakers to Cincinnati, UCF, and then to Florida in the Birmingham Bowl. But it's a new year for the Pirates, a small core group of returners and quite a few new faces on the field as well. Six-year head coach Ruffin McNeil says goodbye to Captain Carden, but has four three-star QBs to choose from. Sophomore Kurt Bankert battled JUCO transfer Blake Kemp this spring. Bankert appears to have the lead, but Kemp still has a shot, as does 2013 backup Cody Keith. At the wide receiver position, the Pirates lost two of their top three targets and returned five who caught at least 14 passes. Slot receiver Isaiah Jones will likely step into Hardy's role. The Pirates lost their best ground threat, Brayon Allen, but have three solid options fighting for the starting job in Chris Hairston, Marquez Grayson, and Anthony Scott. Switching gears to the defense, East Carolina will replace more than half of its starters. They lost three of last year's top five D linemen, but have plenty of big options. The Pirates should be well organized and fast, with the return of players like linebacker Montese Overton defensive end Jonathan White, and inside linebacker Zeke Bigger. Bigger led the American in tackles in 2014 and was a second team all-conference selection. Where the Pirates will need to improve is its pass defense. Cornerback Josh Hawkins returns. He recorded five interceptions last year and was a semifinalist for the Jim Thorpe Award. But the rest of the secondary only had three picks. The loss of corner Dietrich Allen and safety Lamar Ivey means that ECU will be relying on untested newcomers. True freshman Corey Surgent had an impressive spring competing with Hawkins. Taking a look at the Pirates' 2015 schedule, they'll open up against Towson at home before heading on the road for a rematch with Florida in the Swamp. They then open up conference play on the road against first-year member Navy before welcoming Virginia Tech to Greenville. Other highlights on the schedule include playing on the road at BYU, home against Temple, on the road at UCF, and then closing out the regular season in Greenville against Cincinnati. There are definite question marks for the Pirates, but the biggest ones have potential answers. They may not be everyone's preseason favorite for the conference crown, but their recent track record shows they belong in the conversation. Coming up, we have Nate Summers on the phone to get the inside scoop straight from Greenville. Welcome back. We're now joined on the phone by the sports editor at the Daily Reflector, East Carolina beat writer Nate Summers. He's been covering the Pirates the past 11 seasons. Thanks for taking the time to talk to us today, Nate. Yeah, great to be here. All right, so let's start off with the offense. They're obviously going through a lot of changes this season, not only replacing Shane Carden and Justin Hardy, but also the head of the offense, Lincoln Riley. What will the Pirate offense look like this season? Well, I think what they hope it will look like and, and what they, they have planned, you know, since they, they got here, uh, you know, five going on six years ago as a staff, was what they planned was that when a transition like this happened, that it would be almost not noticeable. So, um, you know, Dave Nichols, the new offensive coordinator, had been groomed and already uh, handpicked by the staff, and including by Lincoln Riley, um, to kind of be his successor. So um, that was part of, uh, of that plan, again, to... to Sort of anticipate the change long before it happens, um, and, and that goes into the, the change at quarterback as well. Uh, you know, Shane himself was, was groomed into this offense uh, when Dominique Davis was the quarterback those first two years. Uh, and I'll always go back to saying that, that probably the, the, the greatest thing that happened to this team early on was having a guy like Dominique Davis those first two years who, who could kind of just snap his finger and, and fit into the offense while a, a longer-term quarterback like Shane was, was getting ready. And, and Kurt Banker, who is obviously the odds on favorite to be the new uh, quarterback for the team, has gone through the same process. You know, he, he's been in this offense himself for, for a few years now, even though he hasn't played yet. And obviously there's a big difference in what you do in practice or the film room and what you do on the field in a real game. But 
Uh, he is as ready as, as someone can be in, in much the same way as, as Shane was. Uh, so, that, you know, the transition, really, the way they've designed it is, is to be a, not a, a big drastic uh, shock in, you know, replacing a guy like uh, a Justin Hardy, who, you know, in so many ways is a one-of-a-kind athlete and one-of-a-kind one of a kind story. Uh, with all due respect, you, you have arguably a, probably a better athlete coming in than Isaiah Jones than what Hardy probably was his first uh, year. Now, granted, Hardy just took off in an un unexpected, phenomenal kind of way, but um, it, when you have a slot receiver like Isaiah Jones to fill in, he almost uh, has taken the back seat these, these first couple of years of his career because of a guy like Hardy. So uh, you still have a lot of great untapped potential on, on offense. Um, and really, I think the, the key, and like anyone would say probably, uh, is how the, the line up front plays and, and how they use what's actually now a lot of really talented running backs. And that's the other, I think, kind of uh, misconception about a, a team that throws the ball so much is that they have no running game. But uh, very quietly, uh, East Carolina has, has stockpiled some really, really talented um, running backs and, and guys that they you know were able to recruit and sign away from some, some big schools. So uh, it'll be very interesting to see how that uh maybe becomes more a part of it with Dave Nickel as the uh, new coordinator. Now going back to the quarterback conversation a little bit, we saw Kurt Bankert at the end of that North Carolina game for a second. Uh, how does he compare to Shane Carden? Well, it's similar, you know, and, and that, again, that, that, that is the, the thought process when, when these guys are recruiting is, you know, how much, how much of these guys fit in already to what we're looking for and, and, and how much can these guys in, in maybe one or two or even three years uh, be a part of, of what we do, and uh, I think it's very system oriented how they find a guy like Bankard. I mean, uh, I can remember um, w when Bankard, so literally the day that the Bankard uh, uh, committed uh, verbally to East Carolina, uh, I I know from back then how uh, how excited the the entire staff was, and you know Lincoln was the guy that that got the um, got the commit from him, and I just know I, I can I I remember how how much they felt like he. They, they had found the next guy potentially that, that they really felt like would fit all that, that they could, um, you know, coach into the system and that, that already fitted pretty well. So he's very similar. Um, you know, I, I think he uh, was, like Shane, was, was not recruited a ton by the, the bigger schools and, and, you know, in that respect has, has something to prove. Um, he did take a lot of uh, late pushes during recruiting. He's, you know, verbal very early to ECU and, um you know, managed to, to stick stick to his commit, but um, very similar. I mean, he, he's got a strong arm. Uh, he, he, he fits in with the style that that, uh, that we've seen. A, a, a lot of short throws over the middle. He's a pretty precise uh, passer. Now he struggled a little bit in the spring, uh, as you might expect. Uh, going live, 11 on 11, he threw some interceptions. Uh, you know, on on kind of close reads and, and jump routes and that kind of stuff. But uh, he'd rather have him throwing them then and have the offseason to correct them. Uh, than throwing them early in the season, but it'll be interesting to see uh, as a young quarterback how he may you know, struggle early on in the season. Yeah, and when most people think about ECU, they immediately think offense. What's the defense going to look like this fall? Well, I like the offense. I mean, you know, they, they lost some, some key, uh, key guys at key spots, but it'll be interesting to see um, you know, how those roles get filled. Of course, they have guys uh, you know, that they're really hopeful will be able to step right in just like on offense, but uh, you know, right up front in the middle, they lost, uh, you know, their two main guys on the defensive line, Terry Williams and uh, Krishan Rose, who ended up playing a ton of uh, football uh, when Terry Williams was not playing. Uh, so both of those guys are, are gone, and uh, there are some young guys that will have to play a, a whole lot more that haven't, haven't played a ton there. But uh, they do have a lot of experience at the end. They have a lot of experience back at linebacker. I mean, this is really, in, in so many ways, uh, is Zeke Bigger's team. That's the, the middle linebacker, leading tackler the last couple of years. Um, one of the more visible guys you'll you know see on the field for ECU for that reason. He's uh, kind of just all over the ball. Um, so they, they have the luxury of having that back. They also have Monty Overton back at outside linebacker, who's a much much quieter guy, but uh, nonetheless could have a uh, I think a, a pretty big season. Um, and as usual, the, the question for, for ECU, like it has been for, for a long time, will we'll be at the back end. Can they defend the big pass? Obviously, anyone who knows uh, even just a little bit about ECU these last couple of years, uh, especially last season, 
um, up to and including the Hail Mary uh, that they lost on to, to Central Florida. Um, that, that has been kind of the big uh, black eye for this team on numerous occasions. But, again, they have a lot of talent. You know, Josh Hawkins comes in at corner as a senior with, uh, I think, a lot to prove. He had a huge start to the year uh, last year with a Jim Thorpe candidate uh, and admittedly kind of let some of that stuff go to his head a little bit and didn't play as well later in the season. But, um, you know, they the, the secondary on this team, I think, will always come into every new season with something to prove just because it's gone that way these, these last few years. Talking about the non-conference schedule, uh, East Carolina, they they play well out of conference and that's kind of become a trademark for them. Which game on the non-conference schedule are you most looking forward to this season? Well, it's definitely a different one, uh, you know, with, with uh, a couple of uh, uh, new scheduling contracts coming in uh, with Towson and uh, with BYU just from a personal standpoint. and. Uh, in the realms of a sports writer uh, checking off great stadiums uh, off his list, BYU for me is one that I've waited to see for a long time, so I'm pretty excited. But um, it, it's tough as, as usual, but uh, I, I think sort of uh, scheduling down for that first opponent like they have started doing as opposed to trying to open the season with a, a mega blockbuster kind of game, uh, it's not always the most exciting way to start a season, but I think it helps. Uh, helps your team, uh, you know, play that, that first real game in, in a non, you know, pressure-packed situation in most cases. Uh, and, you know, like I say, we've seen that uh, a, a few times here over the last couple of years. And, and, and again, it, it, it doesn't necessarily create that, that huge big game environment. But what it does, I think, for a team like ECU is that uh, it, it allows you to play a little bit more of the big boy for a change and a little bit less of, of the underdog when, when you open with opponents that, that you... Uh, expect to be, uh, and I think that that's good for uh, for where this this program is right now. Is to uh, especially after a big year in the American last year, uh, coming into the, this year with the title game and, and everything else to play for. I, I think you, you this, this is the world in college football where if you're where ECU is, you have to uh, have to act like a big boy in in uh, order to get some of what you want. So uh, it's an interesting schedule. The game of Florida, obviously, I haven't even mentioned, but. Uh, uh, to say that will be tough, they'll only need to, to go back to the last game of last year to know how tough that is um, and how tough that will be. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, it's, uh, as always, it's going to be a tough one. Um, but they'll be able to get some momentum, I think, right away. Yeah, you touched on the UCF Hail Mary, but that was only one of about three late-season heartbreakers they went through last season. Uh, how do you see ECU faring in those games this year? I mean, Temple, Florida, and Cincinnati, too. Well, it's going to be tough again, but you know, if, if experience is worth anything, uh, this team got a lot of it in, in that regard. Um, and you know, I, I think that's where, where the, the experience thing is uh, sometimes a, a little overrated. Honestly, you know, experience can can sometimes help you in, in knowing how to act in certain situations. But uh, every game being so different, uh, you know, you've got to make different decisions in different key situations in different games. So. Uh, you know, I think it's always going to be uh, uh, tough, and it, it's just such a different league, and we knew it was going to be that way. But uh, I think, you know, with the huge Conference USA influence of teams coming in, uh, ECU obviously being one of them, uh, I and a lot of other people wondered if it would just turn into Conference USA and these sort of wide open shootout type of games. But, it, you know, it really isn't, even though there are a few high scoring ones. Um, you know, you, you have to be able to you have to be able to get stops defensively. You have to be able to, uh, and this speaks to what you were saying about those, those heartbreaker games. Uh, when you get the ball in a key situation in a tight game, uh, you've got to be able to finish it. You've got to be able to, to score a touchdown when you need a touchdown and, and not settle for a field goal or uh, not not be disorganized uh, in the most critical moments of the game. And that that would definitely be the, the knock on last year's team uh, from anybody, from a from a writer, from a fan, from a you know. Uh, an opponent is that, that you know ECU had a lot of and squandered a, a, at least a handful of uh, game-winning opportunities in those games. Yeah, and for a team that has a few question marks, having to replace obviously um, some big-time players from last year. Looking at their schedule, is there one game that stands out that might be the defining one and kind of uh, you know test the character of this year's team? Well, I, I think those divisional games are, are all huge ones, and I think that you know again I, I can't stress enough that. I just think that the entire uh, scope of a league changes when you suddenly got a conference championship game at the end. We saw that with Conference USA. Uh, you know, all of a sudden these games become 
Uh, and, and that goes back to the rivalry development that was always the biggest challenge in Conference USA. You have all these teams scattered around uh, that, that never really have played each other historically. How do you make rivalries? Well, I mean, that, that's how the Central Florida ECU rivalry became a lot more legitimate and a lot, you know, a lot less just because they had played before. I mean, you start playing games that count for division uh, titles and possibly for championship game bursts. And, Everybody's your rival at that point, and all the rivalries are real, and uh, that's that's how you get uh, a credible league with you know with real competition that, that people can actually uh, get into uh, if they're not necessarily fans of the league or one team. But um, I don't know if that I, I, for that reason I don't know if I would necessarily say other than those late season, uh, especially divisional opponents. Um, you know, that's what makes it again for I think a great season. And uh, if East Carolina is a competitor at all, then you have to immediately point to those November games, those league games, uh, where really every week, uh, and East Carolina certainly learned this when they went to Temple and lost last year after, you know, building a ton of momentum. Uh, that game, you know, that, that one game uh, each year can, can really come back and bite you and, and be the difference in your whole season sometimes. Uh, so, yeah, I think any game, any league game in November is, is, is a big one. All right, Nate. Well, I know we're looking forward to seeing the Pirates kick off this fall. Thanks again for taking the time to talk to us today. Thanks a lot for having me. Appreciate it. Again, Nate Summer, sports editor at the Daily Reflector. ECU kicks off their season at home September 5th against Towson. For the American Digital Network, I'm Haley Outen. Have a great day.